Greetings, today we will discuss a theorem, it is known as the addition theorem for spherical harmonics and we will also get involved with coupling of angular momentum. So, let us remind ourselves that uh, we discussed the rotation group, we developed a representation for the rotation group in angular momentum Eigen basis and this is the rotation operator. We have for any angular momentum j at 2 j plus 1 dimensional basis and the matrix elements of the rotation operator in this basis is what gives you the Wigner d matrices. So, these are the famous Wigner d rotation matrices for different values of j and as j increases they become larger as one would expect. So, we will use the Wigner matrix to establish a theorem which is known as the addition theorem for spherical harmonics. It, it has a lot of application in atomic physics and also in nuclear physics and then we will also talk about adding angular momenta. So, uh, have a quick look at this figure, but I am going to develop this figure a little more systematically. So, you do not have to remember everything, but basically I am going to be using spherical polar coordinates which all of you are familiar with and I will reference spherical polar coordinates with reference to two different z axis. Okay, one is a z which is a blue axis, the other is z prime which is the red axis and this one is tilted with respect to the previous one and the polar angle is always measured with respect to the z axis or for the red frame it will be the z prime axis that is the polar angle and then there is also an azimuthal angle which is measured with respect to the z x plane in the spherical polar coordinates. In the new coordinate system it will be the z prime x prime. So, just remember that and then we will develop this in some specific detail. So, this is the summary of the spherical polar coordinates and you have got the polar angle which is defined with reference to this z axis and if you drop a perpendicular from this point to the x y plane, the angle that this line would make with the z x plane. So, this entire plane that you see over here, this makes a plane an angle of phi with respect to the z x plane. Okay. So, that is that is the angle which is azimuthal angle and any direction which is the direction of this unit vector r, this is specified by these two angles which are the polar angles, the polar angle and the azimuthal angle. Okay. So, these are the angles which describe a direction in space and any unit vector which specifies the direction is thus equivalent to a polar angle and an azimuthal angle. So, let us begin with the first coordinate system. This is a Cartesian coordinate system and let us have a new z axis which is referred to as the primed frame. So, the z prime is tilted with respect to the z axis a longer direction which is specified by the unit vector u. Now, the angle that this unit vector u makes with respect to the z axis, this is the polar angle of this direction with respect to the blue frame. So, this polar angle which you would have called as theta, okay, this is a specific angle which is beta and the corresponding azimuthal angle which you get by dropping a perpendicular to the x y plane and then connecting this to the origin and then measuring this angle. So, this is the alpha. So, beta alpha give you the direction of the unit vector u which is along the z prime axis which is the new z axis which is the tilted axis and we are going to refer to spherical harmonics with reference to the blue frame and then also with reference to the red frame and then see how they relate to each other. So, this is the z prime axis. So, this is referred to as the E z prime, this is the unit vector, this is described by the two angles beta and alpha and now 
you have an x prime which is perpendicular to the z prime axis and then a y prime as well. So, that x prime y prime z prime constitute a right handed frame of reference. So, this is your new frame of reference and if you have any arbitrary direction in space like this, this will have different angles polar angles theta and phi with respect to the blue frame and different polar and azimuthal angles which you will call as theta prime and phi prime with respect to the z prime, z prime frame right with respect to the primed frame. So, this is some arbitrary direction in space with which is shown with a vector from the origin. This has got a direction v caret. So, this is a unit vector and this has the angle theta and phi with respect to the x y z frame and theta prime phi prime with respect to the x prime y prime z prime frame. It is quite simple as such. Okay. Now, having defined this geometry, let us consider a point on the z prime axis, any point on the z prime axis. You take this point whose polar angle theta is equal to beta. So, that is what we have written here and whose azimuthal angle with respect to the z x plane phi is equal to alpha. The polar angle theta prime with respect to the z prime axis with respect to the primed frame of reference is however, 0 okay, because it is along it is on the z prime axis. So, that is the geometry. Now, we know that you can simultaneously diagonalize the square of angular momentum and also one of its components. It does not matter which component, but one component can be diagonalized. And if that component is along the unit vector u, then you write the commutation relation that L square and L dot u commute. This could be the z axis, in which case you have the commutation L square comma L z equal to 0. You can also write L square comma L z prime equal to 0, because you can always simultaneously measure L square and one of its components, it does not matter which component, you cannot measure two components, but L square you can measure with any component and there are infinite of them. Okay. So, L square you can always diagonalize with infinite unit vectors L z different directions in space that comes from the isotropy of space. Now, you now have these two directions one is the direction u caret this is a unit vector along which you have taken the z prime axis. The other direction is v which is some arbitrary direction whose unit vector reference to x y z is this r caret and whose direction reference to x prime y prime z prime is this r prime caret. Okay. And these are specified by their respective polar and azimuthal angles, which are namely theta and phi in the x y z frame and theta prime and phi prime in the primed frame of reference, which is the x prime y prime z prime frame. The angle between these two directions u and v is given by this cosine of theta prime, okay, because theta prime is measured with respect to the z prime axis. So, theta prime is the angle between the z axis, it is the angle between the unit vector u and the unit vector v. Okay. All right. Now, let us consider the axis of quantization to be z and you have an angular momentum eigenstate, which is an eigenstate of L z and what you are going to do is to subject this angular momentum state to the same rotation that you have subjected your coordinate frame to. So, you tilted the coordinate frame from the blue frame you went to the red frame and now you subject the angular momentum states to the same rotation and this rotation is affected through the angles beta and alpha as we have already found. Okay. 
So, you take the previous eigenvector, which is the eigenstate L m, its coordinate representation in terms of the angles theta and phi is what gives you the spherical harmonic, right. So, this is just the corresponding you know notation in the de Broglie Schrodinger notation, you would write this as a spherical harmonic, in the Dirac notation, you would write this as the coordinate representation of the state vector L m. Now, you subject this L m to the same rotation and you get a new angular momentum state. So, this is what you have got, you get L m prime as a new vector, which you get by subjecting L m to a rotation. We know what this rotation is, this rotation corresponds to the angles beta and alpha. Okay. And this would be expressible, expressible as a linear superposition of the angular momentum states, in which m prime is the dummy index, it can take 2 l plus 1 values, those values going from minus l to plus l. And the matrix elements will be the matrix elements of the rotation operator okay, in standard matri matrix representation formalism. And these are the matrix elements of the Wigner D matrices corresponding to the angular momentum L. Okay. So, there is a superscript L which must show up on this D matrix. Okay. So, now let us you know here I have used the summation index, which is the, the first index. The first index is the dummy index. Now, you take the coordinate representation on both sides, that is all you have done in this step. You have taken the coordinate representation on both sides, so that you can write this expression in terms of the corresponding spherical harmonics. Okay. And this is the spherical harmonic with, res, with, res, with the quantum numbers L and M prime corresponding to the direction r and this one is the spherical harmonic with reference to the direction r prime, because now you have rotated them. So, you have got this relation now, the same relation I have written over here, there is nothing new on this slide so far and you have got this spherical harmonic on one side with the primed arguments. And here you have got the spherical arg harmonics with the unprimed arguments. So, this is in a nutshell the result that you get. The matrix elements in this expansion are the Wigner D matrix elements. That is as you can see that this whole proof is really very simple, and you have got this relationship now. Uh, what we will do is to invert this relation, you had written y l m of r prime in terms of y l m s of r okay, as a linear superposition of that. Now, let us carry out the inverse transformation and you know how to go from one orthonormal basis to another and how to carry out the inverse transformation. So, I will not work out the details for you and the invert relation will be this y l m of r will be expressible in terms of the y l m s of r prime with these matrix elements, but you will have the complex conjugation and the transposition over here, right, because these are unitary transformation. Okay. So, now the summation index is the second and there is a complex conjugation which is shown by this asterisk, okay, that there is a star over there, which tells us that there is a complex conjugation. Okay. So, now we can write this relationship also in terms of the angles. So, these angles are theta phi, which are completely equivalent to the direction r caret and these angles theta prime phi prime are completely equivalent to the direction r prime. What have we got? We now take a particular case, 
consider a point on the z prime axis. We have done this earlier as well. Now, for this point, we know that theta is equal to beta, right? For a point on the z prime axis, the polar angle theta, which is with respect to the z axis of the original frame, that polar angle is beta. Phi, the azimuthal angle is alpha, but the polar angle with respect to the new frame, which is the red frame, will obviously be 0, because it is a point on that axis. So, the theta prime is 0. So, consider this special case and insert the value theta prime equal to 0 in this spherical harmonic over here. So, you have rewritten this relation over here once again, but given specific values to theta and phi, theta and phi are now beta and alpha. Okay. And theta prime is 0. Now, this is a spherical harmonic corresponding to the polar angle, which is 0. Now, no matter what the value of L and M prime is, from properties of spherical harmonics, you know that it is always equal to the square root of 2 L plus 1 of over 4 pi and this is the value it has only if and only if m prime is equal to 0, otherwise it vanishes. Okay. Now, these are well known properties of spherical harmonics, which you would have met earlier. So, we will use it and now we can carry out the summation over m prime and then because of this Kronecker delta you will get a term, only one term will survive corresponding to m prime equal to 0, which is this. And now, you get an expression for the matrix element of the Wigner D matrix in terms of the spherical harmonics, okay, because you have expressed the spherical harmonics in terms of the matrix element of the Wigner D. So, you can just invert that relation and what you have is an expression for the Wigner matrix elements, Wigner D matrix elements, which are given by essentially they are spherical harmonics as you can see. Okay. Now, this is a general result, which you can use. So, we have got this result for the Wigner D matrix in terms of the spherical harmonics. And we are going to use this to establish the theorem, which is known as the addition theorem for spherical harmonics. So, we will use this result. Now, you do not have to write down all of this in your notes, because all these slides are uploaded on the course web page. So, you know all the relationships are there. So, you do not have to copy anything, but just keep track of the logical development of the topic and that saves us a lot of time. It saves me a lot of time to write this on the board. It saves you the time to write it in your notebooks, but all the information is available and then we can focus on the discussion. So, that is the idea. So, I begin with the earlier expression for spherical harmonics with reference to the primed angles expressed in terms of the unprimed angles, which we already had earlier. And in this, if you now put m equal to 0, you specialize this relation, which is valid for every value of L and for every value of m. And I take a particular case, namely the case for which m is equal to 0. So, I take this spherical harmonic with m equal to 0. So, that is what I write over here. So, this is the m equal to 0. And on the right hand side, I have this m equal to 0, but I know what its value is, because we just found that out a little while ago. So, we can plug it in. That was in terms of spherical harmonics, right. So, we are going to use this relation, which we had obtained earlier. Keep track of the complex conjugation, of course. Okay. And using that, this 
relation that we had obtained earlier, we get an expression for this spherical harmonic on the left hand side for m equal to 0. So, this m equal to 0 comes over here, the arguments here are the primed angles theta prime and phi prime. These are expressed in terms of the spherical harmonics with angles theta and phi, which are the unprimed angles and the coefficients, which are coming from the matrix elements of the Wigner D matrix are again spherical harmonics with respect to a specific angles beta and alpha. Okay, we know what those angles are. And then of course, there is the square root of 4 pi over 12 plus 1 and because there was a complex conjugation over here, we now have a complex conjugation over here. Okay. So, you must always be careful that you do not lose any information while substituting these terms. Now, the right hand side is a summation over m prime and m prime it makes sense to use m prime to distinguish it from some unprimed m, but since there is none in this relationship we might as well drop the prime altogether. Okay. It is just a dummy label which is summed over anyway, it is easier to write it without the prime. So, I have rewritten this relationship with m used instead of m prime. So, that is what we have got summation over m. This spherical harmonic for m equal to 0 is nothing but this polynomial function, the Legendre polynomials which you have met. right? for m equal to 0. So, the left hand side these are well known properties of the spherical harmonics and then you get a relationship for p l cos theta in terms of the spherical harmonics which is this. So, you take this factor root of 12 plus 1 over 4 pi on the right. So, you get this 4 pi over 12 plus 1 on the right and then you have got a summation over a product of spherical harmonics done. This is a theorem which is known as the addition theorem for spherical harmonics okay. and as you can see its proof is really quite straightforward, but you will find that it is an extremely powerful theorem and you will find very many applications of this and a lot of angle momentum algebra that you will be doing. You will need to plug in this result every now and then. So, you really need to have a good handle on this theorem. Now, we have these directions. So, this is just a reminder of what this geometry is and uh, essentially this angle cosine theta prime. Theta prime is the angle between this z axis and this axis. So, if this is the unit vector u and this is the unit vector v, this is the angle between vectors u and v. So, you can write this for two arbitrary directions u and v. Okay, it is exactly the same theorem, but now written in a form which makes it look much more general, because you can now relate it to any two arbitrary directions, no matter what those directions in space are and the direction in space is shown by a unit vector u and now this result that you now have at the bottom is completely general, because it does not make a reference to the red frame or the blue frame and you can tilt these frame any which way you like for any two arbitrary directions in space and that is really what makes it so powerful. For any two arbitrary directions in space, if you want to know what is the Legendre polynomial corresponding to the cosine of the angle between these two directions, then you can always write it as a sum over products of corresponding spherical harmonics okay? and this is the result. So, uh, this is a very powerful theorem and what we will now do is to consider not one, but two angular momenta, why not? even each electron has got two sources of angular momentum. It has got the orbital angular momentum, which has got nothing to do with orbits. 
it also has spin angular momentum which has got nothing to do with this spin of a top, but it does have a spin angular momentum which is completely independent right. So, it is a different degree of freedom. Moreover, you are not going to be doing atomic physics with just the hydrogen atom and when you deal with atoms with more than one electron, you will have two electrons, three electrons, 10, 20, many right. And each electron will have its own angular momentum, it will have its own orbital angular momentum, it will have its own spin angular momentum and the atom is going to have a net angular momentum, which is coming from the addition of all of these angular momenta. So, you need to learn how to add these angular momenta and the angular momentum in classical mechanics is a pseudo vector, you know how to carry out the addition of these vectors, but the vectors we are now talking about are not just vectors, they are quantum vector operators, three attributes right. So, you are not going to use the law of addition of vectors, which is the addition law, the triangle law or the parallelogram law of addition of vectors as you call it right. That is not the law that you can use, that is a law which you can use for vectors, that is not the law for quantum vector operators and that is a law that we now have to learn. So, this is the addition of angular momenta and what it will do is this addition corresponds to a rotation of vectors of a composite space. So, you have got two vector spaces now, one which is an eigenspace of one angular momentum j 1. And there is another vector space, which is the vector space of the angular momentum j 2. What do we mean by angular vector space of j 1? This is the vector space, which is spanned by the Eigen basis of j square and j z, when j is equal to j 1. Okay. So, for j 1 square and j 1 z, you have got a certain vector space. Likewise, if you have another source of angular momentum, which you call as j 2, it will have its own Eigen space, which is spanned by the Eigen basis of j 2 square and j 2 z. And you are now going to work with this composite space made up of these two Hilbert spaces. So, you have to learn how to compose this composite space. Composite you have already implied a composition, okay. composition involves putting things together. right? And there is a certain law that has to be prescribed of how you put it together. So, this is called as the product space of the two separate vectors. Okay. This is called as a product space. So, these are the key words, the composite space and the direct product space of two separate vector spaces. And typically, you represent a vector in a Hilbert space by a ket. Now, what can you do with these vectors? You introduce inner products, you know what they are. So, corresponding to each vector in the Hilbert space, you define an adjoint vector in the adjoint space right. And between these you introduce products, which you call as the inner products. You also introduce outer products. Now, the inner products are scalars, the outer products are operators right. So, this operator would operate on some other vector and give you a new vector. So, this is an operator. So, there are different kinds of products that you compose from vectors, one is an inner product which gives you a scalar, you also introduce outer products which give you operators and now we introduce also direct products. So, one the inner product is a bracket, the outer product is a ket bra and the direct product is a ket ket and this is 
what is called as a direct product in the composite space, one of which comes from one Hilbert space and the other comes from the other Hilbert space. And then you define this product, so it is also called as a product, means you do not want to invent new words. So, you use the same words again and again, they are all products, but with new meanings and each meaning is well defined in its own context. So, you have got an eigenspace of j 1, which comes from eigenvectors of j 1 square and j 1 z, which can be simultaneously diagonalized. You have got an eigenspace of j 2, which is spanned by the eigenvectors by the simultaneous eigenvectors of j 2 square and j 2 z. And now, we introduce this composition, which is the addition of j 1 with j 2. You can call it as j or as j 3, it is the same, there is a third angular momentum, which is the final net angular momentum you get. And because this is not just the usual addition of two vectors, you can represent it with a different symbol, you can put the plus sign in a circle or invent a new symbol to represent this binary operation. Okay. It is essentially a new prescription, a new binary operation, which is being introduced to define the addition of these two angular momentum. And it is a good idea to use a different symbol at least once in your life. The reason is it tells you that this is not the same kind of addition as addition of two vectors, it is not. But having done it, you can use the same symbol. So, it does not matter what symbol you use. These are quantum vector operators, not ordinary vectors. So, all the three, the j 1, j 2 and j 3 or j, these are quantum vector operators. And I will use a notation, which is the angular kets, the angular vectors. You look at this vector on the screen, and this vector is an angular ket, which I will use to represent the eigenstates of the uncoupled eigenvectors of j 1 and j 2. I will use a different notation with these circular brackets okay, to represent eigenkets of the coupled angular momentum. Now, this notation is not very standard, it is not very specific, it is not essential. And there are many books, which do not use different notations, but I am going to use it, because it offers a little bit of convenience, which you will find as we go along. Because once you start putting in numbers over here, once you have angular momentum, you do angular momentum addition for j equal j 1 equal to 3 half and j 2 equal to half and so on. Right? You are going to have to put in numbers and then it becomes easy to keep track of, which was the uncoupled vector and which is the coupled vector. Of course, you know it from the context, so it is no, not such a big deal, but having an additional suggestion as to which is the uncoupled vector and which is the coupled vector is often useful at least to begin with till you get used to it. So, I will use angular momentum eigenkets with these circular brackets to represent eigenstates of the coupled angular momentum. And this is being introduced only for notation and this is not a very standard notation in different books you will find different notations and you should not worry if you see different notations. In fact, one could use different kinds of brackets right to represent the inner products as well. You can also use some more notation and some more and we will use some of them to our advantage. And I will make a distinction between the angular brackets, the circular brackets and what do you call these beautiful brackets, this is what I call as a beautiful bracket. Okay? And we will use all of them. It is not mandatory, but it is useful. Okay. So, you will not necessarily find it in many books, because it, it, it makes some analysis easy, especially when you do problems. 
uh, you will see how it turns out to be useful. Okay. So, now we have these angular brackets which are the uncoupled angular momenta and the circular brackets which are the coupled angular momenta. Okay. Now, the coupled angular momenta are j m s right and they are coming from coupling of what? They are coupled therefore, there have to be two other angular momenta which are j 1 and j 2 and that is implicit and you do not necessarily have to write it every time. So, you can make this notation compact by suppressing this j 1 j 2. So, this is a compact notation for the coupled angular momentum, but if you want you can write all of it as well and sometimes at least to begin with when you are doing problems and once when you are getting acquainted with these techniques it is a good idea to write all the quantum numbers. So, this has got an Eigen basis which is an Eigen basis of the coupled angular momentum which is j square and j z and they will have Eigen states given by two quantum numbers j and m because both of these are simultaneously measurable and later I am going to use this beautiful bracket as well. So, okay, here we have the coupling of the two angular momentum j 1 and j 2. So, now you have got two alternate basis sets, one is coming from the direct product of the spaces which are the Eigen spaces of j 1 and j 2. The other is the Eigen space of j square and j z which is the coupled angular momentum is the same space. Okay. You are only referencing it differently and therefore, you can always carry out orthonormal transformations, unitary transformations from one basis to the other. So, one basis which is called as the direct product basis, this is a basis of the direct product of the eigenvectors of j 1 and the eigenvectors of j 2. These are the eigenvectors of j 2, these are the eigenvectors of j 1. What you have in this beautiful bracket is a direct product of j 1 m 1 and j 2 m 2. This gives you one basis, you know the dimensionality, this will go from you know each m 1 will go from minus j 1 to plus j 1. So, the dimensionality will come from 2 j 1 plus 1 times 2 j 2 plus 1, because m 2 will take 2 j 2 plus 1. So, that will be the dimensionality of this basis and the dimensionality of the basis on the of the coupled vectors better be the same, but that is something that we really have to establish, because we know what j and m can take. We know that m can go from minus j to plus j and j will also have a certain range which perhaps you have learnt in your first course in quantum mechanics, but we have to establish what that range must be like. So, that is going to be part of our exercise. So, we have to find this dimensionality, it better turn out to be what we expect it to be, it will turn out to be what it is, but it is not a result that we will take for granted, we will actually prove it. So, this dimensionality of the direct product basis, this is not very difficult to see, it is obviously 2 j 1 plus 1 times 2 j 2 plus 1. The dimensionality of the basis of the coupled basis is not obvious, we expect it to be equal to this, but it is not obvious at least for the beginner, for the experts amongst you, you know the answer, you know the answer and I hope that you also know the proof for that. Okay? So, we will discuss the proof for that. So, I guess I am going to take some questions at this point, because essentially what I am going to introduce now are what are called as the Klebsch garden coefficients. Okay? These are the scalar coefficients, when you go from one expression of any vector and you can express it 
in terms of superposition of eigen vectors of the uncoupled vectors or as a superposition of eigen vectors of the coupled vector and you can carry out transformations from one to the other. So, that is a complete comprehensive topic by itself which I thought I will discuss in a separate class which will be the next class we I will take. In the meantime if there are any questions over here I will be happy to discuss. Yesterday's question I assume that you already found what the answer is as to why you need an inhomogeneous magnetic field for the stern girl right. Okay? because mu dot b is just the energy, but you need a force right, to separate the spin up component from the spin down component and that force can come only from the gradient. Okay, so, that is where you need the inhomogeneous magnetic field. So, that is okay, that is that is no big deal about it, but any other question? So, thank you all very much.